to you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome everyone. I know we have quite an international bunch tonight from many different nations joining us. Well done for getting here. <laughs> well done. In my experience, you can teach on many things. This is, this is what's happened to me. You can teach on many things. I can teach about love or discipleship or giving or even missions. And you know, you get a degree of opposition. But there's no greater degree of opposition that I ever have than when I approach this subject. And I won't go into detail on another time. You can ask me and I'll tell you many a tale of things that have happened to me when you come to preach on end times. Equipment that goes bonkers, you know, tapes that are blank, etc, etc. So we really do come up against it. I guess that's not surprising. So well done for getting here. Um, do pray for yourself. Myself, my wife is here. We've been praying for several hours here just for God to open your mind. Excuse me. For God to open your mind, your understanding, for you to see and perceive perhaps things that you have not perceived before. So agree with me on that point. That If you remember, Jesus said to the crowd, you will be ever hearing but never perceiving, ever seeing. And I pray tonight we will see and perceive and hear and indeed continue to be changed. Let me recap momentarily on what we said um, last week. Have you ever missed a motorway exit? You're driving on the motorway, right? Maybe you've got your headphones on or you're listening to your music and you're bopping away. Not me, of course. And you, you go straight past the sign. You go straight past the exit. And the first thing you say is, there was no sign. There was no sign. What, did you see a sign? But the next time you take that journey, you realize there's many, many signs. Many signs. But you weren't paying attention. And goodness knows life has a lot of distractions, particularly at this moment. I mean, you could even, if you know what I mean, be forgiven for missing the signs. But we will never accuse God of not giving us a sign. I tell you that. No one will ever be able to say to God, you didn't warn us. You didn't tell us. You weren't detailed enough. <laughs> we have had more than we could ever dream of. There's signs and then there's the sign. Many signs. But the Jews returning to the homeland, Jesus said, this is the sign. So after that sign, all the other signs are different. For example, that was 1948. So if there was an earthquake in 1945, the earthquake's important. But it's not as important as an earthquake in 1949. Because once we have the sign of the Jews returning to their homeland, all the signs after that start to take on a whole different perspective. And after 1948, we are without excuse, biblically, or in terms of the light that you have received, we're without excuse for not sitting up and paying extra special attention what a privilege, what an honor. We looked at that last week. I gave you three foundational scriptures that I think are helpful for us. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 39, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 8, where Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom will go around the whole earth, and then the end will come. And we just highlighted there's a difference in the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. Very different things and very different consequences on the nation. So the gospel of salvation is when I preach the gospel of salvation. I pray that people repent of their sins and they get saved. But Jesus specifically said the gospel of the kingdom. When the gospel of the kingdom travels through the nations right around the world, then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom is about Christ as king. It's a society thing. We looked at Christendom. And how the nations that formed that gospel of the kingdom, as well as the gospel of salvation, the nations, or the, in some ways, empires, the Roman Empire, coming out of that, the Roman Catholic Church embraced Christianity. And it had a national effect, a governmental effect, and they became a superpower. Also in Britain, we see the gospel of the kingdom, the queen appointed as the defender of our faith, not just the gospel of salvation. But receiving Jesus as king, Britain became the superpower. We see in America, 
Not just the gospel of salvation, but Abraham Lincoln with a famous portrait with his hand on the Bible. One nation under God. So it was a gospel with inviting Jesus as king and there were consequences for that and consequences for those that didn't make it governmental or structural. The second scripture was Acts chapter 16 verse 6 where we see Paul wanting to reach his own people, his own area. And Jesus saying, no, I want you to go west. I want you to go to the Gentiles. I want you to get a mind and a heart for all nations. And we see that big shift. And lastly, Malachi chapter 4, verse 8, where you and I are called to go to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. I'm not waiting to go to heaven to see the fulfillment of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation in my church. That's something I need to produce now and present to Christ as he returns. Did you get that? <laughs> I am called by God to produce a church on the earth from every tribe, from every tongue and every nation, an international church. That's my commission. That's my task. It's not something in heaven. Yes, it is. But it's something I work for now. It's something I produce. Don't wait for that. Rather, produce that. Going to move on tonight to, to part two, and I t entitled this message, The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> um, I'll come to what that means later, okay? So don't get spooked by that. Why study end times anyway? I mean, why study end times? Why do we need to do this? Well, there are over 100 verses, 100 passages in the Bible teaching you about the Antichrist. So anyone who says don't study the, that part of the Bible, that's just about as crazy as it gets. Of course you need to study those. Of course you need to do that. What are you going to say to people? Don't read the book of Revelation. You don't need to. This is crazy. But I get this all the time. I've had it for years. We don't need to study. Of course we need to study this. A major part of your Bible is devoted to this. What is it? 16 of the 26 parables that Jesus told were stories and parables advising the end times church. So don't listen to people who misguide you that we don't need to study this. We most certainly do. We've got the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, 2 Thessalonians, 1 John, and countless references by Jesus Christ. Tonight our focus, and by the way, you don't have to panic about taking notes. I can send you a book. I've written a couple of books concerning end times. One about the function of the church in end times, and one is general theology surrounding the end times. And I can send you that for free. Just contact us and we'll get it to you. We also have many audios and videos online on this topic. Tonight's topic is the Antichrist and looking at his emergence in the world. And if I can begin by pulling back and making a few observations. The big picture tells us this. The Antichrist works with a twofold strategy. He works to deceive the world and to seduce the church. To deceive the world and to seduce the church into bad behavior, bad loyalties. And we even know how he does that. In Daniel chapter 11, it says, with flattery. Flattery. <laughs> Always be careful of people who flatter you. Always be careful with people who flatter you. With flattery, he will deceive and corrupt the nations. Be very careful of that. You know, there's a big difference between encouragement and flattery. Someone who encourages you, encourages you for your benefit. But someone who flatters you, flatters you for their benefit. So don't be a flatterer. I hope I'm not. It's not in my nature. i rather just say it like it is. It's manipulative, devious to flatter people. Very manipulative. And the Antichrist works with this form of deception. He deceives the world and he seduces the church. And I'll explain how in a moment. In the Bible, he goes by many, many names. They're all over the place. The beast, the wicked one, the little horn, the man of stern countenance, the man of sin, etc., etc., etc. One of the main central parable, uh, chapters in the Bible is Matthew chapter 24, famous end times 
chapter and we read part of that last week when the apostles the disciples were asking Jesus can you tell us about the end times and Jesus in verse 4 Jesus answered watch out that no one deceives you and here's the first thing the biggest thing deception is coming my way deception is coming your way worse than that many people <laughs> for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and they're going to deceive many people on your left and on your right are going to be deceived because they don't listen to things like this and don't give their times. Now, at the end of the, those few verses we looked at last week, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Look at that. Let the reader understand. Now, I, I, there, I don't know what I can do to draw your attention right now. <laughs> There's only two times in the whole Bible that this happens. This is how important this is. And then people say you don't need to do end times. That's how ridiculous some can be. Only two places in the whole Bible. It's almost like Jesus said, okay, stop the traffic. If you don't understand what this means, then the advice of Jesus Christ is to stop everything and go and find out what Daniel was talking about. That's the advice of Jesus. Let the reader understand what Daniel prophesied about the end of time. When it comes to, to teaching this, and I've taught end times in many cultures, in many situations, you get all kinds of reactions. Some people have are totally fascinated it's a fascination factor, like rubbernecking type thing, you know. They see it as something, you know, fantastic. And other people get full of fear. Neither of these things have ever been my motivation. And I would encourage you not to have them as your motivation either. My total motivation is responsibility. I feel I have been trusted with to live in this day, and I have the responsibility to articulate some of these truths in a way that people can understand them and that's what I'm attempting to do. People have always been fascinated with predicting the future. When I was in France in Paris I went to the Alma tunnel just to see what happened Princess Diana. Very sad wasn't it? Very sad where she had her hope shortly before she died in that tunnel she went to see a fortune teller who she had seen many times. And the fortune teller, Diana told her friend, told her many things about the future. <laughs> Funny the fortune teller didn't see her dying in a tunnel, huh? Be careful of those you trust in with prophecies. And horoscopes are very popular. There's no newspaper in this country and around the world that comes out without a horoscope. People are interested in predictions and prophecies about themselves but horoscopes statistically are 95 percent wrong and then you've got scientific deduction i guess after covid19 and listening to the government's predictions and the scientists predictions nobody's ever going to trust scientists again scientific deductions are currently running 75 percent wrong or so but i think and I'm not joking, after the, the spate of predictions we've had in the last few months or years, the last year with COVID, I think we have very little trust in that. Biblical prophecy is around 80%, just over 80% correct and finished, and we only have a small, somewhere between 15 and 20% left to be completed, to be fulfilled. That 15 to 20% is going to happen so I wouldn't be thinking that we've got any length of time there. I'd be very, very uh, hesitant about thinking that is going to take a, a time. This can all happen very, very quickly. And indeed, Daniel warns us about that. Anything that's good in this world gets copied. If they create a good car, someone copies the car. They build a good phone, they copy the phone. You know, the iPhone was revolutionary. And when that came out... Samsung immediately began, sorry if you're a Samsung fan, but they immediately began to copy it all. They copied the software, they copied the, the, the shape of the phone and the glassy surface. 
So Apple took them to court for two billion. I think they won one billion. Anything that's good gets copied. And you can imagine Lucifer and worship. Many worship leaders here tonight. Imagine Lucifer. You need to be extra, ca extra cautious with this. And it, Lucifer is worship, 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 worship. But something in Lucifer wanted the worship that was going to God, wanted the power, the authority that God had. Something twisted was there. And I tell you what, guys, nothing has changed. <laughs> Nothing's changed. It's exactly the same today. The people in our churches that are the most vulnerable are the worship team, the prayer teams, and the evangelism teams. They're the three most vulnerable in every church I've ever worked with. Vulnerable in all manner of ways, which is not our topic for tonight. But you need to be very careful about this. Many angels in heaven, you know. Isn't it funny that it was the worshipping angel that just wanted for himself so nothing changed. He gets kicked out of heaven. You know the story. He's in the garden. Man fails to control him. And the original sin in human beings, this same Satan hasn't changed, hasn't learned his lesson, walks up to Eve. Walks up to Eve and says, hey, hey Eve, you can be like God. Trying to get Eve to fall for the very same rebellion. This is original sin. This is the heart of original sin. You can take authority over God. Funny that he went to the woman and not to the man in the first instance. It says something about the desire of the heart, I believe, of a woman's heart. And the interest of a woman's heart and wisdom and understanding and insight. And he deceived and enticed Eve with that. And Eve ignored her husband, ignored her oversight and went straight in and took and down comes the human race. So... There's nothing original in original sin, if you know what I mean, right? It's around today. It's the same thing today. So be careful. I thank God for the Apostle John. In 1 John, he's incredibly articulate about the nature and the form of the Antichrist and the way he operates in the last days. And I remember the first time I began to study this. This was so helpful to me really opened my eyes to the nature of how the Antichrist functions. It, to, to begin with, in 1 John chapter 2, John says, be aware that the Antichrist, an individual, talking about a person, John says, be aware the Antichrist will come. And then in the same verse he says, but be aware many Antichrists, plural, individuals, have already come. And are moving amongst you. And then in 1 John chapter 4. He says. And the spirit of Antichrist. Is most certainly in our world. And I find that a really really good structure to think about. And it helps me. You know discern with spiritual eyes. The world in which I live. Yes there is an Antichrist. There is a human being. A man. A person. Who will come in this time. But secondly. Secondly. There are many antichrists, many individuals who have gone out over time and tried to deceive and have indeed deceived many. And yes, there is the spirit within our societies, within countries around the world that is so antichrist. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. And many of you will experience that in your neighborhood, in your schools, in your universities, in your hospitals, where anything connected with Christianity, certainly in the world today, just comes into contention, doesn't it? anti-christ anti means against or to replace against christ or in place of christ that which sets itself up in place of jesus christ or against christ but let me say a few words about this fake jesus this fake christ this anti-christ this false christ this copy of christ this imitation of Christ. If you go to New York City in, in, the, in Times Square, there's so many people selling fake watches, <laughs> fake handbags. You can buy anything you want fake in Times Square, I tell you. And they're all scampering all over the place. Anything that's valuable or good gets copied. 
So what is, what is the Antichrist copy? Well, God the Father has a son, Jesus Christ. And God the Father put his authority into his son, sent his son into the world. And God the Son sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And today the Holy Spirit in the world carries through the authority of God the Son. God has a father. Uh, uh, sorry. God the Father has a son, Jesus Christ. And the Son sends the Spirit. Well, Satan has a son, if you like. Son of Satan. That's a good movie title, isn't it? Satan has a son. It's the Antichrist. And Satan gives the Antichrist his authority. Just like God the Father gave the Christ his authority. And the Antichrist passes that authority on to the false prophet. Just as Jesus passes the authority on through the Holy Spirit and through the body of Christ. So we see a complete mimic going on here. And just as we see miracles, God working miracles in our churches around the world in all these centuries, so this false prophet who is closely connected with the Antichrist forms, performs miracles. Many people are so impressed with this. The Bible tells us that at some point the Antichrist is fatally wounded, probably shot, assassination. But he rises again. And the world is aghast, they're amazed. And the false prophet really broadcasts this. Look how supernatural this being is. Surely this is the Messiah. It's a fake resurrection. Just as Jesus the Christ was raised from the dead, so the Antichrist and the false prophet orchestrate this false resurrection. The Antichrist at least begins his public uh, appearances with calling people for peace, peace, peace. <laughs> the Bible says, you know, when you hear men saying peace, 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 be very aware that the end is very near. The trouble is with this type of peace, you can't make peace with the devil. Hello? <laughs> can't make peace with the devil. And many people try to, uh, many, you know, leaders over the years have come to me to get me to make peace with this or make peace with that. But you don't know what you're doing. You can't make peace with something that you can't make peace. The Bible says Jesus, Jesus didn't come into the world to bring peace, but he came to bring a sword and division. That's what he came for. To separate you from the devil and his works and to bring you to a holy kingdom. So be careful about peace, 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 friend. Be careful about those who call you for peace or say that you're not a peacemaker. I am a total peacemaker. It just depends on who with. And it depends whether they're asking me for peace on the basis of biblical criteria or whether they're compromising because that's the very thing the Antichrist will do. It's the spirit of Antichrist. You should work for unity. I do work for unity. I believe in unity. But that doesn't mean I can unite with the Antichrist. It doesn't mean I can unite with just anyone. What fellowship has light got with darkness? So this appeal for peace and unity, this accusation against those who are Bible believers has been down through the generations, but it's just as alive today if you stand on the right doctrine. So you can see many ways in which the Antichrist copies Jesus Christ. <laughs> From the beginning, you remember Cain, how God put a mark on Cain, set him apart so that Cain could go out and he had the protection of God. How wonderful is that? And God has done that really in all generations. In, in Pentecost, remember, the mark of the Holy Spirit. They were marked with fire, with the fire of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Excuse me. And many of you will know what it's like to be marked with the Holy Spirit. You walk into work and people look at you. Even in Tesco's or walking down the street, people look at you. They don't know what to make of you. They can sense that you are different. You're set apart. You're marked. You've got a mark on you. It's the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit and people don't know how to, where you fit or why are you different. And many of them, over time, they come and say, excuse me, can I talk to you? 
I noticed something different about you. And this same Mark, the devil envies everything God is and everything God has. And just like God's children are marked, so the Antichrist and the false prophet, they want their mark. They want the mark of the beast. They want everyone to carry their mark. Something that will identify and tie them with him as these are my disciples. These are my children. Wow. When it comes to preparation for living in the end times, last Sunday in our church here in London, we were talking about authority, probably one of the best studies you could ever do in your whole life. If you want to benefit your life, <laughs> if you want to get any degree of stability and a forward thrust in your ministry, in your future, study authority. Study authority. But if you're going to be an expert in anything, be an expert in that. That will bless you so much. So many of the problems in life evolve from this one origin. Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord means he's God Almighty, God Eternal. Jesus is the man. Okay? And Christ is a Greek word for Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew He's the Lord Jesus Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very important. He came in a body and he's transferred that authority back into the body. Now, listen carefully, folks, because I have a body. And when I got saved and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, do you know who entered me? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit entered me, comes into me, lives in me. Many scriptures explaining this greatly. And his authority can work through my body. His authority can work through my life. That's how authority works. Remember at the Last Supper, Judas had it in his heart to betray Jesus Christ. And instead of rejecting that thought, instead of fighting against that thought of rebellion and disobedience, he entertained that thought. And he entertained it so much that the doors opened. You know what the Bible says? Satan entered. Here we go. Here we go. When I'm born again, the Holy Spirit enters me. But at the Last Supper, it says Satan entered Judas. And Judas is a, is a prototype. It's a forerunner of the Antichrist. Someone who was against Christ. Who wanted to be in place of Christ. Who wanted his own way, basically. Remember the temptations. And you can see that many rulers around the world give their allegiance to wrongdoing. Indeed, to the spirit of Antichrist. Or to Satan. Remember in the temptation when Satan himself came to Jesus to tempt him. Remember what he said. You see all these kingdoms? I can give you this. These kings, they bow down to me. These kings, they obey me. And if you obey me, I will give you these crowns, these horns, this power. I will give this to you. But you must first bow down and worship me. Right? So be aware, guys. Jesus resisted that temptation. But the same Satan who offered the Christ... Power over the nations. This same Satan gives that power to the Antichrist. And the, this Antichrist receives this power. And this is what Jesus was telling us to be aware. Let the reader understand this from the book of Daniel. I'll show you in a moment. But as I, you know, just the last couple of days looking at this subject afresh, as I pull the camera back, pull the lens back and look at the big picture, I just became so aware of the, the danger of influences in our lives. What's influencing me? Look at how Satan influences the Antichrist and empowers him. Look at how the Antichrist influences the false prophet. Look how the false prophet influences the nations and the church. I got to be incredibly careful about the influences in my life, in my family, very careful who's influencing me. 
Am I just going to let that happen? And in many of these things, it's gradual, gradual influence, gradual taking control, and we can sleepwalk our way into it if we're not attentive. Let me say a few words about science fiction. Many of you are old enough to remember a movie called Back to the Future. Remember that? Well, when that movie first came out, again, it was considered fantastical. We'll never have a car that can drive itself, you know, and all these different things. But look at how quickly that movie, I mean, it's been overtaken. It's not just been fulfilled. It's been well and truly surpassed. And the best things that men could dream up of whenever that year was, I don't know what it was. But even in their wildest dreams, that's the best they could come up with. And mankind, as Daniel said, knowledge will increase. Mankind has surpassed in this very short period of time, even the scientific, you know, dreams that they had. So in times gone by, you had to argue the case that certain things were possible, like a cashless society. You don't need to argue that anymore. Half the shops don't take cash anymore, right? So you don't have to argue that anymore. Isn't it amazing how quickly things are, are changing? I mean, as it says, you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. And in times gone by, again, people would say, well, that's ridiculous. How could it ever be? How could that ever happen? But today, you can't go into a supermarket unless you've got a mask on right? <laughs> you can't get on the bus unless you've got a mask on. So what's going to be next? What's going to be next? You can't come in the supermarket unless you've got ABC. You can't come on the bus unless you've got ABC. And scripture said all those years ago, no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark. So for me, that's amazing. Amazing. All those years ago, John was able to see that the day was going to come in history, and here we are, when society, the, the, the even purchases within society are going to be controlled by the Antichrist indeed. I'm not going to go into details tonight. I've done that in other teachings, which you can find online. But this is the, the famous barcode that you hear so much about. This was invented by a guy called George Lawler in 1973. And uh, you have not had permission to buy or sell on the international market, by the way, since 1973 without a barcode. Uh, and, and the reason 666 became so famous and the reason barcodes and chips and everything else are, are notarized all over the world by Christians is because this George Lawler is just a simple mathematician. But he created this because he saw a problem. He saw that there's an issue with, with uh, codes around the world. There's an issue with buying and selling. And he simply correct, uh, uh, invented a better system. But because it goes beep, beep, beep at Tesco's, he needed an entry point, he needed a midway point, and he needed an exit point. And in order to create these, in his testimony, because Christians have spoken to him many times, why did you make it like this? Because he began the barcode with a six. He put a six in the middle and he put a six on the end. So Christians were fascinated. Why did you make it 666? These are not numbers, by the way. These are called, what are they called? guard bars. They're called guard bars that, that the beep reads correctly, but they do denote a six. So they're the, sh the same shape as a six. It's just they're a bit longer, if you notice. And all barcodes are the same. And he just said, because it was mathematical symmetry, because it worked well mathematically. And that's the only reason why I created it to look like that. But I'm not going to go into that in any detail. It, 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 will there be a connection with barcodes and chips? There could well be. There could well be that these things are going to come about, that they will want to, they, they will definitely want to inject us in our hands and our foreheads because scripture tells us that. What they inject us with specifically, we'll have to wait and see. But I think we will know at that time because we, it, things will become uh, very apparent and probably quite soon. So what was considered science fiction? No, not now. Not now. Cashless society, we can accept that, right? Absolutely we can. A chip, we can totally accept that. We've got chip. Your dog is chipped, for heaven's sake. 
<laughs> it's not that, you know, find my phone. Your phone is chipped. We can find your phone. So it's not a great big leap for human beings to have to have some form of chip. So the scientific, the, the, the sci-fi thing has really gone out the window. We're, we are past that point. We're past that point. And now we're coming down to fine detail. Fine detail about how this is going to work. So when he emerges, thank God the Bible is clear about the way the Antichrist functions. When it becomes apparent who he is, he takes control in certain areas, in politics, in religion, through war, and in finance. These are the four big areas in all the different passages, if you study them. Because these are the areas that mankind has huge problems in. They need a messiah. And there's been a messianic attitude towards our leaders anyway. I followed American politics for years. And it really is like a messiah has come. You know, when Trump got elected, it's like, oh, hail the new messiah. Or when Obama gets elected or JFK. It's like society, humanity needs a savior. I need someone to help us. We're in a political mess. All the religions are fighting each other. All the wars are about this faith thing. And look at the finances. And so scripture tells us that the Antichrist most certainly will walk onto the, to the scene with some amazing achievements. No one has ever been able to uh, efficiently bring peace between Jews and Muslims. That's just a dream. But somehow, scripture tells us that he forms some sort of peace treaty, seven-year peace deal. Peace, peace again is his cry. Be careful of that. His first tactic is that way. And because of this, this and many other achievements, many people are going to be fooled by him, be dazzled by him, by his great achievements so quickly. He's going to bring solutions to problems that have not previously been solved. And this makes him highly desirable. You know, if you have a fleeting thought in your mind, that this is not possible. I would challenge you to have a little think about a man called Adolf Hitler. Hitler came to power in Germany when Germany had gone to the dogs. They needed a political answer. They needed, a, a, they needed an army. They needed a force. They needed survival. They needed a financial answer. They needed to, so, to re-energize their economy. Look at the power that man ended up with. Look at how he moved from nation to nation to nation. I mean, he is definitely, for me, a, a forerunner, a prototype. So just in case anybody thinks this can't happen, what we saw in Adolf Hitler is a little tiny example. A little, little tiny example. So much so you don't even hear about him in scripture in any specific way. So that tells me that the Antichrist will excel the evils of Hitler many, many, many times over. So, once again, pulling back and looking at the big picture of what Scripture tells us about the Antichrist, how he will function, and how we will recognize him, there are two principal places where we find this. One is in Daniel chapter 7. And the second place is in Revelation chapter 13. These two places really, one, they comment on each other. They're an elaboration of each other. And you can read both. They're virtually identical in many, many ways. But Daniel was an end times prophet. And I'll read some of this to you. I've got pages and pages of scripture, but I'm going to read some scriptures and then I'll comment on them. Daniel chapter 7 in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of the dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. 
The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human being was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision, at night I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth and it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another man, a little one. This is the first uh, identity of the Antichrist. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another, a little one, a little horn, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before him. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke very boastfully. I'm going to skip forward to verse 15, Daniel 7:15. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit that the visions that passed through my mind had disturbed me. I approached the one standing there and said, what is the meaning of all this? So he told me and he gave the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four great kings that will rise on the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. And there's an increasing uh, an explanation. If you read Daniel chapter 7, the angel begins to explain to Daniel all that his vision had entailed. And to put it very succinctly and quickly, it was this. Daniel had a vision of four great kingdoms that were going to come over time. The first was a lion. That was Babylon, the empire of Babylon. The second was a bear. That was the Medo-Persians who were extremely vicious. The bear that tears people apart. The third was a leopard. This is Alexander the Great, moving very fast. Alexander the Great conquered more land than anyone else in history in terms of speed. And he's denoted by a leopard. And the last was a beast, a great beast, different from all the others. And that was the Roman Empire. And it's different from the others because the Roman Empire was never conquered. Never conquered by anyone. All the others were conquered. But this beast is different. The Roman Empire was never conquered by anyone. It fell, fell under its own weight. It fell from within. But why is this important? Because Daniel sees that from the roots of the Roman Empire, from the roots of this beast, comes the little horn, the Antichrist. And we're being told this for a reason. Because years later, the glorious Apostle John uh, who I really appreciate John's life and the way he followed Christ. He gets exiled to the Isle of Patmos and Jesus Christ himself begins to speak to John and tells him all that's going to happen in the end times, but it's in picture form. But in Revelation chapter 13, John writes this down. The dragon stood on the sh sh shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. With ten crowns, this is power, rulership that the Antichrist has over nations. It had ten crowns on its, on, on its thorns. And each one had a blasphemous name. Listen carefully, folks. The beast I saw remembered, uh, uh, resembled a leopard, but it had a feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that's the devil, the dragon gave the beast his power. The devil gives the Antichrist his power. Satan gives his antichrist his power the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority satan still needs that body huh and great authority one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound shot perhaps but the fatal wound had been healed and the whole world was filled with wonder and they followed the beast people worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast 
and they worshipped the beast, and they said, Who is like the beast, and who can wage war against it? Skipping forward, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, we see the entry of the, the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming up out of the earth. So the Antichrist comes out of the sea. The false prophet comes out of the earth. They're not the same person. They're completely different people. Many people teach they're the same person. They're not the same person. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like that of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast. So the false prophet is moving in the authority given by the first beast, just like the Holy Spirit moves on behalf of Jesus. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed and it performed great signs. So this is the false prophet working miracles on the earth, even causing fire to come down from heaven in full view of all the people. And because of the signs it was given to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an, uh, an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword, yet lived. And the second beast, the false prophet, was given power to breathe to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. That number is six. Six, six. Famous 666, which has been hijacked by Hollywood. It didn't come from Hollywood, friends. It's in your Bible, okay? So you need to take it seriously. Now, if I was to take a really simplistic approach to understanding 666, I could put it like this. It says it here. If it is the number of man. So you have the, the, the Antichrist is a man. False prophet is a man. And it's, a, it's an unholy trinity. We have the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Holy Trinity. And we have an unholy Trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And I could say 666 is the best that man can do. When they try to rebel against God, the best that man can do is your 666. But they're not capable of overthrowing the 777, the power of our God, as we're told multiple times. Hallelujah. God wins. That's the end of the book. Read the end of the book. <laughs> I've had so many people ask me, is this vaccine that we're all being offered in the UK, is this the mark of the beast? Is this the mark of the beast? <laughs> well, okay, just slow down a minute. Where's the beast? If it's the mark of the beast, where's the beast? So we need to be careful here that we don't run ahead. We need to have a beast for there to be a mark of the beast. Secondly, it's very clear he forced everyone to worship the beast. Worship. So no one's asking me to worship a beast at this moment. And the beast is not that evident at this moment. But I believe very soon will become very evident. So the first thing you see there from Daniel is a very clear outline of the way politically that the Antichrist has these horns, these crowns, control over nations. And again, I would repeat, if you have any doubt of that, just reconsider the Second World War and the ease with which Hitler moved. The speed and the ease with which they just you know, drifted across Europe, demolishing everything in his sight. Politics first. Religion also, you, you see it here, how the false prophet brings people and if they don't worship there's your religion there's your religion worship the antichrist and this is your new world order your new world religion and this this prophet this false prophet is going to form many signs many miraculous signs that will fool and deceive many false fire right strange fire so guys just in terms of faith be very careful of the whole ecumenical movement. 
There are many churches that I can't work with. I get it constantly. I can go so far, but then I hit a boundary. I hit a moral boundary, a theological boundary, a biblical boundary, and I cannot cross that boundary. But many leaders, in the name of peace, in the name of unity, they start to compromise. And this, for me, I cannot do and I will not do. There are many people I will not work with. I've had, I, I can't even remember the number. I've had many churches say to me, we want you to be our pastor. But when I look at the theology of the church and I say, well, I can't, I don't agree with this. this I profoundly disagree with some of these teachings that you as a church adhere to. And they say, well, you can still be our pastor, but we're going to hold these. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. So I cannot be your pastor. I'm not going to have unity with you. You need to change this. Do you understand? This is not biblical. This is not correct. So I cannot unify with you. No. Not unity at any cost. Not peace at any cost. And it's sad to me because I know a lot of senior leaders and some of them go wrong. Some of them in their church prayer meeting, they're praying against the works of the Antichrist whilst at the same time shaking hands and uh, unifying with churches that are completely wrong. You need to make your mind up. You need to make your mind up. You're making peace with people that Jesus would never have made peace with. Never, ever, 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 ever. So be careful of the whole one church thing because that's very much how the, uh, the Antichrist heals. And then you've got war. Much said by Jesus about this, about war. Let me just interject this one point. The devil doesn't repent. Satan doesn't repent. Never. Demons don't repent. <laughs> Demons don't repent. And when, when you're working with people in different churches over the years, I, I've developed my own philosophy, theology on this. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And so when I'm dealing with people, I have to make an analysis. Am I dealing with the world? Am I dealing with the flesh? Or am I dealing with the devil? You know why this is important? Because the devil never repents. So I find it easy working with people who are in the world because I know that they can repent. That person can have a change of heart and they can repent. So I work with them. If someone's in the flesh, I work with people in the flesh all the time. No problem because I know they can repent. But the trouble when a demon, when a spirit is dominating someone's actions and their influences and their behaviors, I can't work with that. And so I have to be very strong. Do you hear me? <laughs> As a Christian, you need to have a very working uh, discernment of the world, the flesh, and the devil because the devil never repents. You can only drive the devil out. That's what you do. You don't try and make peace in that sense. So Satan doesn't stop. And that's why you have the wars. You have ongoing wars and wars. And Jesus himself speaks about this multiple times. Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21 then, as some people spoke to him about the beautiful temple and the stones and the donations, he said, see these things that you see, the day will come when not one stone shall be left on top of another. So they said, tell us, teacher, what will the end of the time, the, the signs be about when these things will take place? And he says, here he goes again, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name. And he goes through the same dialogue. And then in verse 10, he says this. Nation will rise against nation. These are the wars. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places. And there will be famines and plagues. Pestilences. Fearful sights. Great signs. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you. And they will persecute you. Delivering you to the synagogues and to prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Jesus, God help us. I'm going to skip forward in this uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, and I'm going to go to verse 25. Luke's Gospel, 21, 25. Jesus is still continuing a description of the last days. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and the earth will, and will be in the, the distress of the nations. And great perplexity will come. The seas will be uh, roaring. Men's hearts will begin to fail them for fear and expectations of the things that are coming on the earth. Then the Son of Man will appear in the clouds. Now, in verse 28, listen to this. Now, when these things begin to happen, 
look up when these things begin now please folks what is jesus saying when these things finish when these things begin everybody say begin when these things begin when you see plagues begin when you see wars begin when you see pestilences begin when these things begin look up because your redemption is near and then he goes on in the next verse verse 29 on and he criticizes them about the weather <laughs> he says you know when it's summertime you know when it's raining you know the clouds and yet you don't know when the son of man is coming back my, my wife was saying to me yesterday it's very cold it's freezing and I said to her, don't worry about it. In seven or eight weeks, it's not going to be cold anymore. I know the signs. I know the seasons. And do I know the signs of the times biblically? So he was criticizing them. Farmers, people who knew the land. Shepherds, people who knew the seasons. And yet when you see Israel return in these last days, people can ignore it. Let me begin to conclude or wrap up tonight. I know it's a lot to take. There's nothing I can do about that. Some things are complicated. But as we come to all this teaching about the Antichrist, about the political turmoil, about the pestilences, the wars, and all these things and the mark of the beast, in nearly every place in the Bible where you study the Antichrist, you will have a word of hope concerning the rapture. The, rem the rapture means the removal of the church from the earth. Now there's a lot of controversy on this issue. There are many different opinions on this issue. We know for sure that there will be a seven years on the earth of great trouble. That seven years is split into two halves. The first three and a half is called the tribulation. The second three and a half is called the great tribulation. They're very different because right at the midpoint, this Antichrist sets himself up as God right there in Jerusalem. And that just tilts the whole thing. He turns on everyone from that point on. And there's a theological debate which is raised for generations. When does the church get removed? Do we get removed in the beginning, the pre-trib people? Do we get removed in the middle, the mid-trib people? <laughs> Do we have to go all the way through to the end? Personally, I can see very good arguments for all three points. From my perspective, my conclusion, I will study the Antichrist and I will be aware and I'll keep my eye on politics, on religion, on, on, on all these things. Yes, I will. But you know who I'm looking for? Jesus Christ. When you see all these things begin to happen, look up for who? For the Antichrist? No, not for the Antichrist, for Jesus Christ. Look for Jesus Christ. And when, I, when is Jesus going to come and take his church away? Well, you, your head's going to start spinning in circles if you listen to all the different arguments on that. But in this same chapter, Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Jesus finishes off by saying this, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, with drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that the day of the Lord here, comes upon you unexpectedly, you missed your exit. For it will come like a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Listen to verse 36. Watch therefore and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape. What? Escape? Did you say escape? Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Jesus just explains, the Antichrist will rise, there will be earthquakes, there will be wars, there will be famines. And then after all this terrifying dialogue, he finishes by saying, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So there, this is just one example I could read many to you. In 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul goes through the same kind of procedure. He talks about the end times and he talks about us being raptured from the earth. Now, I, I better mention that there are people who say that the, the rapture and the second coming of Christ are the same thing. There are many people who believe that. It's on the same day, it's the same time, that's it. It all happens on the same time. I don't know, I don't think I agree with that. The reason is that the scripture gives very different descriptions. 
The rapture is like a thief in the night. Bang! They're gone. What happened? But the second coming, every eye will see. The whole world is there. You've got Armageddon and everything else. These are two very different occasions, very different happenings. So to say that they're one for me, that's, that's a misunderstanding. I better conclude. I'll conclude with 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 where Paul talks about the mystery of lawlessness, the Antichrist being revealed. And he says that the, the one who restrains this evil in the earth, will, he's talking about the church, will be removed. And then the Antichrist will have freedom, as it were, to carry out his evil deeds. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7. I'm going to leave it to you to study the rapture. I'm going to leave it to you to make your own mind up. My final decision on this, I'm going to get ready for Jesus Christ. That's my decision. Get ready for Jesus Christ. I like John Hagee, and one of John, he's an expert on end times, and one of the things he said many times is, you can study this all your life, but whatever you do, don't lean too heavily on your own understanding, because what happens if he comes tomorrow? What happens if you were wrong? And I really like that part of his teaching, because he's a very in-depth teacher, Hagee. But I like that little addendum, that little appendix that he, he constantly adds in because I think that's the heart of wisdom. You need to get ready for Jesus Christ. Did you ever pl play hide and seek when you were a child? You go and hide somewhere. And you know, the, the person who's looking for you, you think nobody can see you. Maybe tonight you think Jesus can't see you. Maybe you think you're hidden. But when, if, I, if someone was hiding and I was going to seek them, do you know what I would say? Ready or not, ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, here he comes. So I really am going to conclude. I need to be ready. Jesus, help us be ready. Help us be ready. It's very clear that people ignore this advice and they're not ready. They rely on their theology that could be wonky. Need to be careful of that. The second concluding point, which I think is immensely important, when you see these things begin to happen, that's the moment to get ready. That's the moment, right now, 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 now. Once these actions, once 2020 hits, once the Jews are back in Israel, now you begin to get ready. And my final, final, final point. If the Antichrist is close, then the rapture is closer. <laughs> if some of these beliefs are right, if we go up at the beginning, right? Perhaps they're right. Perhaps the pre-trib people are right. Could be. They believe that before the Antichrist comes, the church is removed. I've just read it, 2 Thessalonians 2.7. The, the, the church will be removed from the earth and then the Antichrist comes. To, that's, that's, that's their interpretation. And if that's the case, if they're right, and the Antichrist is close, then the rapture of the, close is much, the, the, rapture of the church is much closer than I actually thought. And the church could go bang at any time. I know that's a lot. You can watch the video. I have enormous notes and I'm more than happy to send you my own personal notes. But I would advise you to go back to the beginning, sit down and take time and work through these truths. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not fascinated by this, nor am I frightened by it. I am responsible for it. That's what I am. I'm responsible for this. And that's why I've given a third degree of my time and ministry time over the last many years to try and promote these truths and to encourage people to pursue them and then to live out the reality and the advice that Jesus gives us. Father, we pray that we would all live responsibly and in a worthy fashion to the callings to which we have been called, this, this high honour to live in these last days. I pray you would bless all those watching and all those who will watch and listen and touch our hearts and cause us to be brave and bold and to go and serve you in these last days. Lord, protect our families. We pray for salvation tonight for 
any who do not believe, even any here amongst us who are not yet saved, why not take this moment to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin and ask him to come in to your life tonight. When you see these things begin, that's the time to look up because your redemption is near. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.